Good morning, everybody. All right, well, my name is Perry Parks, and I want to welcome you to our Sunday School lesson series on the Kings of the Jews. Um, And as the name suggests, we're going to be covering the actions of and God's interactions with his chosen people in Judea. And so we started off this sermon series talking about Saul. Uh, Saul was the first king of Israel, and we saw the monarchy rise to its height at the time of David and of Solomon. Uh, And then we saw it start to decline as it was split into two. You have the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. Last class, um, well not last class, it was a few classes ago, we saw that the northern kingdom was conquered by Assyria, the empire of Assyria, because of their disobedience. Uh, And they actually, uh, once they were conquered, in the last class we saw uh, through Jeff, Jeff Mueller talked to us about the kings that were reigning as the northern kingdom was conquered, and immediately after that, Ahaz, uh, Hezekiah, and Manasseh. This week, we're going to cover um, the last kings of the Jews uh, before God raised up the Babylonians to conquer Jerusalem uh, and send those people off to exile because of the disobedience of Judah. And so one of the things that I hope you see, especially the last thing I hope you take away, is the fact that when we submit to God's discipline, we have hope. Amen. We have hope when we submit to his discipline because we trust that he knows what's best for us. But the first thing that you'll see to kind of lead you into that is that God's reign knows no borders. And he orchestrates the rising and the falling of kingdoms like Assyria and Babylon to be able to accomplish his purposes. So along the way, you're going to see a lot of these different hearts and how they respond to God and his correction um, as they go through the events leading up to the exile. You'll see the, the fantastically soft heart of Josiah, whose repentance is just absolutely legendary. And then you'll see kind of his antithesis in his son, Jehoiakim, whose hard heart rivals the hearts of, you know, you may have heard of people like Jezebel and Ahab. You know, his heart was very hard. But then you will we'll end up with the kind of the flip-floppy, um, vacillating heart of, uh, of Zedekiah whose weak character and, uh, and kind of fair-weather heart led to the exile of God's people to Babylon. So with that, we're going to get started with an overview of the nations God raised and lowered to be able to accomplish his purposes. Before we do that, let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for giving us the scriptures. Uh, we appreciate the fact that your word is there for us to be able to discover the things that you've done with your people so that we can take those things into our heart as well. God, we pray, and I pray specifically, that your spirit would guide me, guide my speech, so that your people can be fed, right? They can be fed in a way uh, that, as you plant the seeds, that it would grow 30, 60 to 100 times more than what was planted, and to you would be all the glory. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. All right. So we're going to talk about how God raised and lowered these these nations, and we're going to be talking about the time period between 642 B.C. to 586 B.C., and this is where we see the, the decline of the Assyrian Empire and the rise of the Babylonian Empire. And you'll see that through God's prophets, like Isaiah, um, he foretold through God, through the Spirit, of how God would use some of these nations to discipline Israel, Judah, and some of the surrounding nations. And you see it starting off in Isaiah chapter 8, starting in verse 7. It says, Therefore, the Lord is about to bring against them the mighty floodwaters of the river, the king of Assyria, with all his pomp. It will overflow all its channels run over all, and run over all its banks. So Assyria, though it was pompous and arrogant, it was raised up by God to be able to conquer the northern kingdom and the surrounding nations and to really bring discipline to those nations because of their disobedience to God's word. But Assyria's arrogance wasn't lost on God. And he would end up judging Assyria, which was the same tool that he used for his wrath earlier. And we see that judgment coming in Isaiah chapter 14. In 26, a little bit later in Isaiah, it says, Therefore, this is what the Lord, the Almighty, says. O my people who live in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrians who beat you with a rod and lift up a club against you as Egypt did. Very soon my anger, my anger against you will end and my wrath will be directed to their destructions. So, Syri- so Assyria was going to be judged and face God's wrath. And we'll see that as we go, that God actually raised up another nation, the Babylonian nation, to be able to do that. And we see that in Habakkuk, starting in chapter 1, verse 6. And he says very clearly, I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places not their own. 
They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and they promote their own honor. So God clearly doesn't condone the behavior of the Babylonians, but he still uses them. And so their judgment, because of their evil behavior, their judgment is on the horizon as well, right? And we see that later in Jeremiah, uh, chapter 51, where it says, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. The daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor at the time it is trampled. The time of her harvest will soon come, for the time will surely come when I punish the idols of Babylon. Her whole land will be disgraced, and her slain will all lie fallen within her. The heaven and earth and all that is in them will shout for joy over Babylon, for out of the north destroyers will attack her, declares the Lord. So in the time period we're covering, Assyria is on its way down, Babylon's on its way up, but soon Babylon will be on its way down as these destroyers from the north, which are really the Medes that live just north of Babylon, are going to come in and conquer Babylon as they are on the rise. And so, you know, I I was reading through this short book, the short book of Habakkuk, and it starts to explain, especially in chapter 2, you'll see these five woes against the injustices that we see in Babylon. Um, And what you'll notice is that Assyria and Babylon, these are not unique. These countries aren't unique. The most powerful nations eventually turn into an Assyria or a Babylon. And so Assyria and Babylon are really just archetypes for all these powerful nations that show arrogance and pride and start rotting from the inside because of their arrogance and pride. And it's not by accident that these nations fall. Because the Bible teaches that all nations that traffic in injustices like these, the injustices that are mentioned in Habakkuk 2, that God is going to punish these nations and bring them down. So they have unjust economic policies that take advantage of the poor. Slave labor tends to come up a lot. Irresponsible leaders that play these backstabbing games to be able to shame each other as they're trying to focus on their own self-enrichment. You know, idolatry. These are the things that the nations that practice, any nation that practices that, God is going to judge them. Now, God works in decades and, 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 and centuries, not in years, but his judgment has come time and time again. And so Assyria was raised and used and then judged and brought low. Babylon, the same thing. But we start to see that God shows no favoritism because Israel... God's chosen people, they were also raised up and used to judge the Canaanites that were in the land that they were going to, that they were going to take over. But we're going to see in this lesson how God even judged and brought low the Israelites because they themselves, after becoming powerful and arrogant, started to rot from the inside as well. And so you see that because they took on those characteristics, they too were displaced. And so this shows us that God's Rain knows no boundaries. His providence is universal. And nations rise with his grace and they fall with his judgment. And so we're going to take some time now to go over a quick timeline of how God's raising and lowering of these nations intersects with his discipline of Judah. And so Assyria at its height looked like this. And so, you know, from the west side, this is kind of around where Babylon is, all the way down to Egypt, you can see that the the nation's huge, right? The empire was was very large. Um, And this is what it looked like when it was at its height. And Manasseh and Ammon were the vassal kings in Judah during that time. But as God raised up the Chaldeans, who were right here, if you not sure if you can see that, but the Chaldeans are right here. He raised up the Chaldeans to be able to challenge Assyria. The Chaldeans include Nebuchadnezzar, who is Nebuchadnezzar's father, right? And so when Assyria is focusing on the West and this struggle that's happening over here, you know, you've got, you know, Nebuchadnezzar taking over Babylon here. They're not focused at all on what's going on over here in the East, in Judah. And this is the space that God made for Josiah to be able to enact a lot of the reforms and restorations that we'll see coming up, right? Where he was able to actually have a lot of influence a lot further than just his kingdom. And so we also see, basically, when Babylon starts to advance, they come up here and they've pushed the Assyrians all the way over here. And that's the point where Assyrians call the Egyptians and say, hey, we need help. Babylon's going to rule the world. And the Egyptians start to come up from down here, marching past Judah to be able to help the Assyrians fight here. Okay? But as they're marching, Pharaoh Necho is challenged by Josiah, right, as he walks through um, the uh, northern kingdom of Judah. And this is the point where Josiah is actually killed by Pharaoh Necho on his march to meet Babylon. 
And so once Josiah is killed by Pharaoh Necho, Israel becomes a, Judah becomes a vassal state to Egypt. At that point, Pharaoh Necho um, takes jo- Jehoaz, who is Josiah's son, as a hostage to Egypt. And once he takes him as a hostage to Egypt, he replaces him with Eliakim, who's another one of Josiah's sons, and changes his name, actually, to Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim ends up paying a lot of tribute to uh, Pharaoh Necho as he's on his campaign up to fight um, Nebuchadnezzar uh, and with, uh, with, Assyria against Babylon, with Assyria against Babylon. And so we start to see that for a while, after, Nebuchadnezzar, after Necho is defeated, Nebuchadnezzar comes down the west coast and he turns Jehoiakim into a vassal of Babylon. And Jehoiakim submits to Nebuchadnezzar for all of maybe about three years before he starts to rebel. Once he rebels, Nebuchadnezzar lays siege to Jerusalem in about 597 BC, and Jehoiakim is killed in that effort. And so once he's killed, Nebuchadnezzar does the same thing that Pharaoh Necho did, which is he takes his son, deports him to Babylon, and then he raises up another son of Josiah in his place. His name was Mataniah, and he changed his name to Zedekiah. Right? And so Zedekiah reigned for about nine years uh, before rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar. And then Nebuchadnezzar had the, it was the last straw. He, commit, he, provide, he besieges Jerusalem. He destroys the temple, breaks down all the walls, and then takes all of the rest of the captives uh, to Babylon in 586 B.C. And so high level, this is kind of the path that we see happening between the first king that we mentioned and their exile into Judah. But as we go a little bit deeper, you'll see God is really trying to reach the hearts of his people through a lot of these stories. He's wanting them and warning them to change. And so we're going to take a look at the first leader, Josiah. So this is Babylon's kingdom. You know, once they, you know, once, let me go back. So once Babylon, you know, conquered, this is their kingdom. It was a little bit larger than Assyria's kingdom as well. But we're going to talk about Josiah, who was one of the first kings. And his response to God's warnings and his corrections was absolutely amazing. So a little backdrop on on Josiah. His father was Ammon, and his grandfather was Manasseh. And Manasseh was the last straw as far as God was concerned. Manasseh, uh, God would save Israel, a remnant of, of Judah, but because of his promises. But after Manasseh, Judah was basically done. Manasseh put idols in the temple. There were, you know, there was prostitution going on in the temple, child sacrifices. And he just spilled so much innocent blood that God was not willing to forgive it. And so from God's perspective, Israel had become worse than any of those nations that had surrounded it at the time. And so the judgment at, after Manasseh's reign was unavoidable. Even though Manasseh was taken to captivity in Assyria, he was humbled out in that captivity, and he ended up, you know, repenting. He came back, and he destroyed the idols, he got rid of the foreign gods, and he started to reinstitute um, biblical worship, or, um, or the worship according to the law. But at that point, the judgment was set. It was an unavoidable judgment. And to make it worse, Manasseh's son Ammon continued his father's practices before he repented, Right? And so at that point, um, you know, Ammon died after about two years of reigning. Um, and he was, and at that point, Josiah became king when he was eight years old. And he reigned for 31 years in Judah. Uh, and Ammon had Josiah when he was only 16 years old. And so Ammon was actually 24 when Josiah died. So he didn't have a heavy amount of influence on his son at the time, it seems. Which is good, because one of the things we see in Josiah is the fact that his heart started towards God very early. And he started to do a lot of great things. And as time goes on, you see him seeking God more and more and more. And he really comes into his own when he's 16 years old. And that's what we're gonna, where we're going to pick up. Josiah when he's 16, in the eighth year of his reign. So 2 Kings 22 says, In the eighth year of his reign, while he was still young, he began to seek God of his father David. In the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of high places, Asherah poles, carved idols, and cast images. Under his direction, the altars of the Baals were torn down. He cut to pieces the incense altars that were above them and smashed the Asherah poles, the idols, and the images. He broke to pieces and scattered over all the graves of those who had, had sacrificed them. He burned the bones of the priests on their altars, and so he purged Judah and Jerusalem. In the towns of Manasseh, Ephraim, Simeon, as far as Naphtali, and that's all in the northern kingdom, and in the ruins around them, 
He tore down the altars and the asher poles and crushed the idols to powder and cut to pieces all the incense altars throughout Israel. Then he went back to Jerusalem. Wow. Josiah is 20 years old. And he is going through this process. He is a spiritual rock star at this point. He's a spiritual rock star and he's like going on this restoration tour all through all the kingdoms, right? Not only, you got to think about this. Josiah didn't just stop at, at getting rid of the idols and the foreign gods and the, and, the, and the false worship in Judah and Jerusalem. He went to the northern kingdom, a kingdom that hadn't been attached to Judah for over a hundred years and more. People that, you know, were supplanted from Assyria, like all kinds of different worship they were bringing into this northern kingdom. And you have to think about how difficult it must have been for Josiah to go outside of Judah and restore even the northern kingdom to the, biblical, to, the, to the practices of worship as taught in the law. It's just amazing the way that he did that. This is unheard of. It's unheard of somebody having this much zeal to turn the entire nation back to God in the way he did. But what's even more astounding is the fact that in the 18th year of his reign, when he came back, it says he came back to Jerusalem, he started to restore the temple in Jerusalem. And when he started to restore that temple, he actually found the book of the law. And when he found the book of the law, he started to read it. And then he tore his robes because of what he saw God was going to do in Judah because of the fact that they hadn't been following God's word. He tore his robes and he started weeping and praying to God. And then he sent out to inquire of God through a prophetess. And the prophetess confirmed it. She said, yep, Judah is about to catch a hard one, right? It's coming down. And so God prayed to Josiah. That's amazing. His soft heart is great, but what really, what really hit me hard was the fact that this restoration tour happened before he ever found the book of the law. He did all this before he even read the book of the law. That is what's amazing to me. Talk about having a soft heart and seeking God with all your heart. This is an example that we really need to imitate. He, he took what he knew and he did something with it. And when he found more, he responded with humility. Josiah didn't compare himself to anyone else. He couldn't because, you know, nobody else had done anything like this. So he just tried with all he had to get everyone, himself and everyone around him, as close to God as he possibly could. And shouldn't we be doing the same thing? Trying as hard as we can with whatever influence we have to get those people that we know as close to God as we can, whether they have a relationship with God or not, just bring people closer. And that's what Josiah was doing. And when he knew more, he did more. That's a soft heart. That's what a soft heart looks like. And we can see in Kings um, chapter 23 how much of an impact he has. It says, Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did, with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his strength, in accordance with all the law of Moses. Nevertheless, the Lord did not from the heat of his fierce anger which burned against Judah because of all that Manasseh had done to provoke him to anger. Wow, Manasseh must have been a really bad dude, right? I mean, think about uh, all that Josiah accomplished. God was still not going to withhold his discipline for Judah because of all the innocent blood that was spilled. But it still wasn't lost on Josiah, right? God still responded. He said, because your heart, in 2 Kings 23... Because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before the Lord when you heard what I have spoken against the place and its people, that they would become accursed and laid waste. And because you tore your robes and wept in my presence, I have heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, I will gather you to your fathers and you will be buried in peace. Your eyes will not see all the disaster I'm going to bring on this place. So Josiah would be spared the experience of seeing Jerusalem crumble uh, because of his heart for God. But it would come in the form of an early death, right? God would take him earlier. And so I wanted to compare Josiah to Hezekiah really quickly. When Hezekiah found out that he was going to be judged for the things that he had done, namely showing all of the treasures of the temple to Babylon, God said that he's going to gather him to his fathers before he's going to see that judgment. And Hezekiah basically said, Ooh, okay, good. At least it's happened in my lifetime, right? It's kind of a selfish response, right? But jo- Hezekiah had a great track record before that. But I wanted to contrast this to Josiah who... After he heard this, after he heard he would die before this would come, he actually did so much more. He instituted a Passover unlike any Passover that had been instituted since kings had ruled in Judah. He gathered people from 
all the way in the northern kingdom and the southern kingdoms and brought them all to Judah and, Judah and all of Israel worshipped God together, celebrating the Passover together in Jerusalem. That had never been done while, before Samuel. And so Josiah continued to move people towards God. He continued to do everything he could to bring everybody to God. And so in my mind, Josiah is a legend. He is a legend. Uh, the, the repentance, the soft heart, he was an amazing man and an amazing king. But unfortunately, his reign did end. And so as I mentioned before, during this, his reign, he was reigning during the fall of the Assyrian Empire. And Babylon at this point had conquered Nineveh, and the Assyrians called Egypt uh, for help to be able to stop their advance here, right? Um, and so Josiah challenged Necho here, right? And that's where he died, right, in Megiddo. As ill-advised as it was for Josiah to kind of jump into this fray, God used this to be able to keep his promise to Josiah, and he did gather him to his fathers before he saw the coming discipline of Jerusalem. But he was missed. He was missed. The Bible says that Jeremiah wrote a lament for Josiah. Not the book of Lamentations, but really a dirge, a song of mourning that the people of Israel picked up. He would be missed. And so we see in Josiah how a soft heart really responds to God's correction. And so I hope we were paying attention because this is the last time that we're going to see a soft heart on the throne of Judah. Okay, so where were we? All right, so we talked earlier about how Pharaoh Necho, in response to Josiah's aggression, um, took his son Jehoahaz as a hostage to Egypt. And he changed his name uh, from Eliakim to Jehoiakim um, as he installed his other son to the throne. And he charged him this tribute to be able to fund his campaign against Babylon. And uh, Jehoiakim, but Jehoiakim couldn't have been any more different than Josiah. I think what happened was Nebuchadnezzar defeated, as I mentioned before, he defeated Necho, and then Je- um, Jehoiakim became Nebuchadnezzar's vassal. Um, but he you know, worshipped him for three years, or he uh, served him for three years, um, but he ended up rebelling. What I'm going to show you right now is what I feel like is the bottom line when it comes to Josiah. It says, therefore, this is what the Lord says about Jehoiakim, the son of jo- uh, the, so, the Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. They will not mourn for him. Alas, my brother, alas, my sister. They will not mourn for him. Alas, my master, alas, his splendor. He will have the burial of a donkey, dragged away and thrown outside the gates of Jerusalem. Whoa, there's a little whiplash there, right? <laughs> Between Josiah and Jehoiakim, it looks like we've entered almost an alternate universe as quickly as we turn to the left. Josiah's son having the burial of a donkey? How do you get there? What do you have to do to completely ignore your father's example and end up being buried like a donkey? And so that's what we're going to talk about. Jeremiah was the prophet that was sent to Jehoiakim while Nebuchadnezzar was asserting his authority throughout the region. And so when Pharaoh Necho was defeated... Jehoiakim again gave his oath, um, and Jeremiah was, Jeremiah, Jeremiah was uh, sent as um, God's message to uh, Jehoiakim. And the message was very clear. Submit to Babylon, because I have given Babylon into your hands. I mean, I have given you, you into Babylon's hands. But after three years, Jehoiakim rebelled, and then Jeremiah sent word to Jehoiakim through a scroll that he wrote down and sent it to Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, send it to uh, Jehoiakim. And so it's really a warning for God to, for, for Jehoiakim to submit to Nebuchadnezzar. And we read how Jehoiakim responded. So that's the timeline of events. So Jehoiakim responded in Jeremiah 36. It says, The king sent Jehudai to get the scroll, and Jehudai brought it from the room of Elisha, the secretary, and read it to the king and all the officials standing beside him. It was in the ninth month, and the king was sitting in the winter apartment with a fire burning on the fire pot in front of him. Whenever Jehudai had read three or four columns of the scroll, the king cut them off with the scribe's knife and threw them into the fire pot until the entire scroll was burned in the fire. The king and all his attendants who had heard these words showed no fear, nor did they tear their clothes. Wow. Burning God's rebuke in the fire? I don't think your heart gets any harder than that. 
you know, we, as we start to read about that, you know, Jeremiah actually was in hiding when he sent this scroll because God knew the heart of Jehoiakim and that he was actually going to look for Jeremiah to kill him. But Jeremiah had more plans for, for Jeremiah. But Uriah, the prophet, actually, actually rebuked Jehoiakim to his and his officials' face, talking about his rebelliousness and his idolatry. And Uriah, and we see why Jehoiakim got his judgment in the way that he responded to Uriah. And we see that in Jeremiah 26, starting verse 21. When, the, when King Jehoiakim and all his officers and officials heard his words, the king sought to put him to death. But Uriah heard it and fled in fear to Egypt. They brought Uriah out of Egypt and took him to the king Jehoiakim, who had him struck down with a sword and his body thrown into a burial place of the common people. Jehoiakim and his whole administration sought to kill anyone that prophesied a rebuke against the way that he was doing things. And the contrast couldn't have been more extreme. You had jo- Josiah, this legend of repentance, whose soft heart was just phenomenal, and his son, his son burning scripture, killing God's prophets. Eventually, Nebuchadnezzar would come and overtake Jerusalem because of Jehoiakim's uh, rebellion in 597 BC, and Jehoiakim was actually killed. The Bible doesn't speak about any specifics about how he was killed, but tradition holds that he was actually killed in the city, tossed over the walls, and hung over the walls so that Nebuchadnezzar's first in command could be able to see that he was dead and it was a mission. And then he was dropped from the walls and left unburied to fulfill the words of Jeremiah. He would receive the burial of a donkey, which is no burial at all. And so here we see the hard heart, the the end of a hard heart that's dismissive of God's word and even hostile towards the correction that comes from his prophets. And so his son, Jehoiachin, was raised a king, but he only reigned for three months. Nebuchadnezzar brought Jehoiachin uh, as a prisoner to Babylon and kept him as a prisoner, you know, until his reign was over. Uh, He instituted um, Zedekiah as king. And so Zedekiah... Um, his name, real name was Mataniah before, uh, before uh, Nebuchadnezzar changed it. And he was a vassal king. And in my opinion, Zedekiah's rule is summed up in this verse. Jeremiah 37, verse 2 and 3. Neither he nor his attendants nor the people of the land paid any attention to the words the Lord had spoken through Jeremiah the prophet. King Zedekiah, however, sent Jehuchal, son of Shelmiah, with the priest Zephaniah, son of Messiah, to Jeremiah... The prophet with this message. Please pray to the Lord our God for us. Zedekiah didn't pay any attention to God's word, but still wanted God's mercy when he was in trouble. So this is the classic, this is the classic, you know, thing of save me, but leave me alone. Zedekiah wanted God as Savior, but he didn't want him as Lord. And this is something that we can see all around us, right? And sometimes it may even float into our hearts where we feel like we want God to do these things for us, but we won't allow his scripture to affect our behavior, to affect, to affect our opinions, to change the way that we do things at home or at work or at school, right? We can't ask God to save us and tell him to leave us alone or we'll follow the path of Zedekiah. And spoiler alert, it doesn't go well for Zedekiah. Okay, so, you know, God, um, you know, God does does a lot of things to be able to correct people. And Zedekiah's path leads him to rule Jerusalem for about 11 years. Um, He paid Nebuchadnezzar tribute for about seven or eight of those years. And we'll talk about what happens after that. But early on in his reign, he began to form an allegiance, an alliance with Egypt and Edom, and uh, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, and Sidon. And God sent him this message, right, through Jeremiah. It says in Jeremiah 27, Early in the reign of Zedekiah, son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. This is what the Lord said to me. Make a yoke out of straps and crossbars and put it on your neck. Then send the word to the kings of Edom, Moab, Ammon, Tyre, and Sidon through the envoys who have come to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, the king of Judah. Give them a message for their masters and say, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Tell this to your masters. With my great power and outstretched arm, I made the earth and its people and the animals that are in it. And I give it to anyone I please. 
Now I will hand all your countries over to my servant Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. I will make even wild animals subject to him. All nations will serve him and his son and his grandson until the time for his land comes. Then many nations and great kings will subjugate him. If, however, any nation or kingdom will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, or bow its neck under his yoke, I will punish that nation with the sword, famine, and plague, declares the Lord. It declares the Lord, until I destroy it by his hand. So the message could not have been clear. God will judge those who do not submit to the one that he has raised up, no matter how he acts, no matter how he behaves. Zedekiah and the surrounding nations were called to surrender to God's discipline that was going to be coming through Nebuchadnezzar. But in the later half of Zedekiah's reign, Egypt tries to continue to make this coalition with Babylon, I mean with um, with Judah and the surrounding countries to challenge Nebuchadnezzar. And so false prophets start to rise up to be able to contradict the words of, Jer- of, uh, of Jeremiah. Pro- false prophets like Hananiah, they say things like the yoke of Babylon is going to be broken and, Jeho- and uh, Jehoiachin is going to be brought back from Babylon when Nebuchadnezzar is defeated. And he says all these things that emboldens this coalition to be able to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. And these prophets, with their lies, get Zedekiah to stop paying tribute uh, to Nebuchadnezzar. So Nebuchadnezzar starts to his march to Jerusalem to be able to squelch this rebellion and lay siege to Jerusalem in the ninth year of Zedekiah. But Jeremiah uses this parable, while Nebuchadnezzar is still on his way, to warn whoever will listen. And it says, Jeremiah 24... It says, Then the word of the Lord came to me. This is what the Lord, the God of Judah, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Like these good figs are regarded as the exiles from Judah, whom I sent away from this place to the land of the Babylonians. My eyes will watch over them for their good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord. They will be my people and I will be their God for they will return to me with all their heart. But like the poor figs, which are so bad they cannot be eaten, says the Lord, so will I deal with Zedekiah, king of Judah, his officials and the survivors from Jerusalem, whether they remain in this land or live in Egypt. I will make them a byword, an object of ridicule and cursing wherever I banish them. I will send the sword, famine, plague against them until they are destroyed from the land I gave to them and their fathers." Again, the message is clear. God will care for those who submit to his discipline and judge those who don't, like Zedekiah. The siege against Jerusalem is absolutely horrible. It's absolutely terrible. There's a rec- it lasts for about two years, and there's a recounting of it in Lamentations. In Lamentations verse 4, it says, Those killed by the sword are better off than those who die of famine. Racked with hunger, they waste away for the lack of food from the field. With their own hands, compassionate women have cooked their own children who became their food while my people, when my people were destroyed. Wow. Starvation driving mothers to eat their children amounts to the worst human suffering I could possibly imagine. I can't imagine it getting worse than that, to drive people to that. After two years, Nebuchadnezzar breaches the defenses. Uh, and the siege is ended. The temple is looted and burned and destroyed. And the walls of Jerusalem come down. And Zedekiah tries to escape. But he gets caught in Jericho and taken to Riblah, which is a little bit north. And there, Je- Zedekiah sees his two sons by Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is in Riblah. And Nebuchadnezzar kills Zedekiah's two sons gruesomely in front of him. And then he pokes out his eyes with hot pokers so that his son's gruesome death will be the last vision that he sees. So it's a very difficult fate, a hard fate and terrible fate, but the fruit of a vacillating heart that wants God as a Savior, but not as Lord. So in 586 B.C., we see God's word fulfilled. Um, and the people of Jerusalem are sent into exile and, uh, and, and gone to Babylon. And this was the greatest disaster that Jerusalem or the Israel or the nation had ever faced. The horrors of it were so fresh in their minds, as you can imagine, as they had to take a 900-mile walk to Babylon. But for those people that remembered that this was discipline, 
and not neglect, there was hope. And we see that hope in Lamentations. Chapter 3, verse 21. It says, I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say, my splendor is gone and all that I hoped for from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I will remember them. I will, I will remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him. To the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. God's discipline fulfilled gives us hope that his promises will be fulfilled as well. And when we are downcast or downtrodden or feel this way... I suggest this prayer. I suggest this prayer. It's a phenomenal way to deal with your emotions in the real way that they come to you, but still recognize that God is sovereign and he'll take care of you. And so it's fulfilled. And he made some encouraging promises to the exiles that they held to. He said in Ezekiel chapter 11, Therefore therefore say, this is what the sovereign Lord says, Although I sent them far away among the nations and scattered them among the countries, yet for a little while I have been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they've gone. Jeremiah 24, we started to read this before. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to me. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. Like these good figs I regard as the exiles from Judah, whom I sent away from this place to the land of the Babylonians. My eyes will watch over them. For their good. I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord. They will be my people and I will be their God. They will return, for they will return to me with all their heart. God promised to watch over them in their discipline, and He did. And He did in an amazing and miraculous way. He watched over Daniel when he was in the lion's den. He watched over Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were thrown in the fire. God watched over his exiles in their discipline. And they trusted him, and we can do the same. So as we conclude, what are we reminded? And what does this teach us? Well, it teaches us that God is with us as he was with them. Hebrews 12, 11 says, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it will produce a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who are trained by it. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God is sovereign. In these two verses lives the moral of our story. First, That God's reign knows no borders and he orchestrates the rise and fall of these nations like Assyria and Babylon for his purposes. And that shows us his sovereignty so that we can know that we have hope when we submit to his discipline. Trusting that he knows what's best for us. We saw that Josiah did this in his life, whose soft heart and repentance were absolutely legendary. But we didn't see this in the life of, of Jehoiakim. In Zedekiah. And so the question is, as we conclude, what do we see in ourselves? What do we see in ourselves? Do we do we act on God's correction like Josiah? Or do we dismiss and attack correction like Jehoiakim? Do we lead others to conviction like Josiah? Or do we follow others off of a cliff in their sin? Like Zedekiah did. Where do we stand? Let's take a look at the, in the mirror to kind of figure that out for ourselves. So that we can start from where we are. And then move to trusting God as he takes us through our events of discipline as well. And the God will be the glory for all the things that we do. Amen? Amen. Amen.